Today is August 16th, 2023. And 46 years ago today, August 16th, 1977, back on that day, Elvis Presley passed away. And on that day, I was working for the Rex Humbard Ministry. I'd like to tell you mostly about my work, this is what this is going to be about, but also a little bit about Elvis Presley too at the end. So please click like and subscribe and take a look at uh, other videos on my channel, see if there's something there that might interest you. So, what I was doing for the Rex Humbard Ministry in the uh, area of Akron, Ohio, actually Cuyahoga Falls, Ohio, but uh, sometimes people have trouble saying Cuyahoga when they look at the spelling. But during the summers of 1977 and 1978, and from 19, May 1979 to August 1980, and from July 1984 to February 1985, I usually spent about 40 hours a week answering a phone like this, Rex Humbard Prayer Group, may we help you? And we would take uh, a prayer request from people across the United States, and I, it was a paid position, and that's kind of rare for many of the television ministries. Most of the people who do answer the phones, a lot of the times they're unpaid volunteers. But uh, we had, did have a chance to uh, lead people who called in who uh, didn't have saving faith, who had never come to saving faith in Christ, to lead them to Christ. And we had a chance to uh, pray for them for many different types of requests. And um, we, in between calls, we uh, also had the chance to uh, read our Christian books and discuss uh, spiritual things or any where from uh, three to four other people working with, with us during those shifts. There were uh, three eight-hour shifts. And uh, it was, I found it as a tremendous preparation for the pastoral ministry. And as I went into the pastorate then in the 1980s after I'd come through seminary. So for those of you who don't know, the Rex Harbard ministry was one of the major television ministries throughout North America first and then throughout the world. And the program started out as uh, church services from the a large, uh, what we call a mega church now, in the Cathedral of Tomorrow in Cuyahoga Falls. The building is still there, and it would include also uh, in later years evangelistic services from other parts, of, different parts of the world, and a number of people. The pastoral staff on the Cathedral of Tomorrow uh, were actually graduates from Anaya College, and uh, they did have an affinity with the um, unofficial, but uh, they did have a background. Uh, from the Christian Missionary Alliance, which is the denomination in which I, I went to serve. The, the denomination or fellowship of the churches, whatever you may. But as the Billy Graham, a lot of adults were reached through this ministry, and there were a lot of times that we actually did reach people who were past retirement age. Yeah, some of them uh, called who really didn't have saving faith, but they wanted prayer about something, and we led them to saving faith in Christ. And, and uh, so, yes, it is possible for an adult um, to come to saving faith in Christ. Uh, there's uh, stuff which says that uh, um, it should happen when there are children. Well, um, sometimes adults can come to know that need to. And I was a full-time prayer counselor uh, for that time, all that time, those, all those years there. And some may have some mixed feelings about TV ministries and not ask, be careful about your comments. And uh, especially of uh, brothers and sisters who were true brothers and sisters of Christ work for different TV ministries and s many support them so um, they're not inherently wrong. I'm sure the money and the fame, the publicity can get to people's heads and that can be a real problem. But uh, during the time of the ministry, during the uh, 1970s, early 1980s to the, the zenith of the, the worldwide television ministry, um, we did offer this 24-7 uh, prayer support. There were two different rooms, an office for our supervisor, uh, desks and telephones, and uh, we did have people who were working with us through the evening shifts. And um, the people on the phone were a combination of Malays, men and women, young men planning or going into ministry, some men already ministry part-time, and others were bound together by simply a desire 
to love and serve God, and unwavering trust is worthy God answers prayer. None of us there were perfect by any means, and some of us there had already gone through deep problems in our lives. But what God gave us through those problems was an ability to speak and to pray with others who had needs in their lives, people who may have been desperate, needy, emotionally hungry, abused, even suicidal, or even just someone who wanted someone to pray with about something. So the, on any shift, it sometimes seemed that the calls uh, for, for a particular problem seemed to come to someone who had that kind of problem and they could approach it with a um, sympathy, understanding, and faith. And usually it was about 30 to 45 calls per shift and I worked 3 to 11 generally as a young man that wasn't a problem. And uh, from 78 in the summer and 1979 to 1980 I was shift lead, which all that really meant was uh, I started to lead the group at our beginning prayer at the beginning of the shift. And uh, a lot of times we had prayers for uh, healing, financial needs, family and friends, sometimes people going through serious addictions, and even sometimes people who called who had definitely been drinking. And uh, But sometimes God would work in those situations. I remember one lady who called who was definitely not sober, and we prayed for her to uh, come to saving faith during the call. And I wasn't sure what would happen, but a little while later, wasn't much too long later, but she called back stone sober and assured me that she wanted to keep on following Christ. And we did refer them to uh, uh, people who came to faith in Christ at different churches and uh, did talk with them about what, what it meant to follow Christ. But really, um, even though occasionally even got calls from Satanists and some other people, the most difficult people for us to work with were generally wayward and backslidden believers. Um, we there at the prayer group were united and desire to love and serve God and uh, we uh, had really to call upon the grace of God to be patient and show love to people who were professing to know Christ or to have known Christ and determined to act in a way contrary to God's revealed word and sometimes uh, we'd simply pray for them that you know whatever they might be asking and Say, uh, God grant it for your glory to quote it as they're abiding in Christ and in your word. And uh, the word does have that uh, condition there. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you will and it shall be done for you. Jesus does get a, that condition and we would apply it to what they were asking. So we don't know, I don't know of any statistics. I do know that they were kept during those years, but uh, we would receive almost daily answers to prayer sometimes as we were talking sometimes uh, uh many times and many times really coming uh through letters and we when there were letters that were happening they were shown to us to, to remind us that we were doing something that was affecting people and there were some testimonies of people being healed from cancer and we usually uh, knew that there were more answers than letters because uh sometimes people would call back for another request after they said another they'd been answered so we never asked anyone while we were on the phone for one penny and uh, we would, said that our prayers are free that we're whether supporting the ministry uh, financially or not and they don't need to pay for our prayers and uh, if anyone wanted to give sure sure they could give so we uh, prayed all that time and uh, Saw, saw many answers, saw many coming to Christ. So this is what I was doing on the night of August 16, 1977, when Elvis Presley passed away. And it so happened that uh, one of the things that happened over the, that day and the next was we would have some weepy middle-aged women calling in who, and they would beg us to pray for Elvis to be raised from the dead. And uh, we kind of said, well, you know, he's already passed away, so uh, we really can't pray in good conscience for that. So um, one of the things uh, we did think about, what, talk about, was that a lot of people, some of the women calling in like that, they really weren't, they were calling for a stranger. They didn't know where he really would have stood with Christ, but uh, 
they had relatives and friends who did know to need to know Christ and what were they doing for them so something that isn't even in Elvis's Wikipedia biography is that uh, Rex Humbard whose ministry I was working for uh, did the funeral for Elvis and apparently sometime he uh, met up with Elvis at, uh, after one of his shows and uh, um, there was a uh, at one point an account of uh, a little bit of what they spoke about but uh, I don't remember what was said but apparently Elvis was really touched in, t in tears and uh, and uh, may have had some more um, desire for for ministry um, Elvis Presley had grown up with a Christian mother and he was surrounded by Christian influence but and there are really some plausible accounts of his promiscuity and drugs which don't show that after he found frame that he had much influence on his life that that influence didn't affect the way he lived day to day and uh, but uh, apparently I don't know what Rex said but he might have uh, witnessed to it but I and there were some people that I do know that uh, when people would visit the ministry saw that, that uh, when people were out in the lobby or in one of the exhibits uh, that Rex would actually take the time to stop out he would witness to that and uh, it's kind of like a situation where Billy Graham once had the opportunity to speak personally with John F. Kennedy not long before his assassination. And Kennedy was, was apparently touched by that uh, time. And there's an independent source that says that in the last days of John F. Kennedy's life, uh, it says that they, he really had a rebirth of marriage with his, Jackie, with his wife Jackie. So maybe those two incidents are connected. I couldn't tell you if they're related or not, but um, I would hope that they are. So moral of the story, it's best assurance for your family is to have a credible testimony. The greatest comfort would be if, if you were to pass away, have a credible testimony of saving faith in Christ and follow Christ as consistently as possible throughout your earthly life. That will be the biggest comfort that they can have, knowing that you're with Jesus, to be, to die, is to go to be with Christ. And certainly, yeah, there are times when uh, people can repent in their deathbed, but no one should ever count on ever having that opportunity. And there's no assurance that we have that if you keep on living in defiance of God, putting him off, that our hearts won't be hardened beyond repentance the time when death approaches. So the best comfort you can give your family after your own passing away would be a credible testimony of saving faith and a life which consistently backs up the reality of that faith. Not, not a perfect life, but a life which backs up that reality and which shows a testimony that yes, my faith is in Jesus Christ alone. That he suffered and died for me. That he's risen again. That he is my Lord and Savior. That testimony to them. And also, while your friends and your family are alive, please spend time in prayer for them. And if you do have a chance to speak to them about their own need for salvation, please do so while they're still alive. People who were calling in about Jesus probably need to pay more attention to their families. That's the way we felt at the time. So, thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. God bless you, and I hope this, I hope this helps you, and I hope this means something to you.